part four chapter twenty nine of a short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine puritan and presbyterian scholars and divines under the name puritan can be included all who are staunchly protestant in their convictions who emphasized the bible as the only rule of faith and who were strenuous for holiness of life and simplicity of public worship whether they were within or without the established church thomas cartwright fifteen thirty five to sixteen o three is the greatest name in the early history of english puritanism he was educated at st john's college cambridge and in fifteen sixty nine was chosen lady margaret professor of divinity and began to lecture on the acts of the apostles his lectures became exceedingly popular and aroused the attention of the high church party they precipitated a conflict which he had to wage all his life he was deprived of his professorship in fifteen seventy he was compelled to spend part of his life in exile on the continent as the only safe retreat from his enemies he published many works in defence of his views of the greatest learning and ability he is said to have been the first preacher in england who practised extemporaneous prayer before the sermon richard baxter sixteen fifteen to sixteen ninety one was reared in poverty and though he never saw a school became one of the most learned men of his time he entered the ministry of the church of england and was called to kidderminster sixteen forty where he exemplified a ministry of apostolic godliness and zeal he found the place a desert and left it a garden no one came nearer than himself to the ideal of the reformed pastor which he makes the subject of one of his books after the passing of the act of uniformity sixteen sixty two he had to leave kidderminster and the rest of his life was passed in the midst of manifold sorrows in sixteen eighty five he was brought up before the cruel judge jeffreys on the false charge of sedition and was sentenced to pay a fine of five hundred marks and to be imprisoned for eighteen months through the exertions of lord powis a roman catholic nobleman the fine was remitted and he was released from prison november twenty fourth sixteen eighty six baxter was far in advance of his age he labored for christian union when that word was not understood Quote, he was an advocate of christian union at a time of fiercest partisanships of christian liberality at a time of stiffest creeds of christian philanthropy at a time of the narrowest sympathies End quote. on july twenty eighth eighteen seventy five a statue representing him in the attitude of preaching was erected at kidderminster and it was inscribed with the words between the years of sixteen forty one and sixteen sixty this town was the scene of the labors of richard baxter renowned equally for his christian learning and for his pastoral fidelity in a stormy and divided age he advocated unity and comprehension pointing the way to everlasting rest churchmen and nonconformists united to raise this memorial a d eighteen seventy five he was a most prolific writer orme enumerates one hundred and sixty eight treatises his saints everlasting rest sixteen fifty and his call to the unconverted sixteen fifty seven have had an immense circulation and have been translated into many tongues eliot the apostle of the indians translated the call next after the bible thomas goodwin sixteen hundred to sixteen seventy nine has been called the patriarch and atlas of independency he resigned his church in cambridge as he could not stand the high hand of laud and went to holland after the archbishop's downfall he returned to london and from sixteen fifty to the restoration he was president of magdalen college oxford he is supposed to be the puritan president described by addison in the spectator number four hundred ninety four he was a member of the westminster assembly and was a rigid calvinist he was a preacher of great power and originality john owen 
1616 to 1683, the Prince of the Puritans, was educated at Oxford, which he left, 1637, as Goodwin left Cambridge, on account of Laud's discipline. Going up to London, he one day attended worship at the Aldermanbury Church, hoping to hear calumny. But a stranger occupied the pulpit, and his sermon, from these words, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? resulted in his conversion. After serving two churches, he was made dean of Christ Church, Oxford, in 1651, and the next year vice-chancellor. He carried out vigorous reforms at the university, and raised it to a high position as a school of learning. In 1660 he was discharged from this office, and lived ever after in retirement. Owen, a staunch Calvinist in theology and a born controversialist, was a man of liberal spirit and in advance of his time on questions of religious freedom. He remonstrated with the Congregationalists of New England on their tyrannical spirit, and in many ways he labored for liberty of conscience. Yet he could not go so far as Baxter in the matter of Christian union. After the Restoration he was treated with much more courtesy by Charles, and he seems to have been held in profound respect by the church party. His learning, his many writings, eighty in all, of great power and ability, his piety and high-minded devotion to principle, caused him to be held in high esteem. Just before his death he wrote to Charles Fleetwood, I am going to him whom my soul has loved, or rather, who has loved me with an everlasting love, which is the whole ground of my consolation. I am leaving the ship of the church in a storm, but while the great pilot is in it, the loss of a poor under-rower will be inconsiderable. He was engaged in religious debate all his life, but he had time to write some devotional works which are not excelled in the literature of that time. It was while one of the best and most refreshing of these, Meditations on the Glory of Christ, was passing through the press that Owen lay dying. Mr. Payne, a nonconformist minister, told him that his book was about to be published. I am glad to hear it, said Owen, but, O oh, Brother Payne, the long-wished-for day is come at last, in which I shall see that glory in another manner than I have ever done, or was capable of doing, in this world. John Goodwin, 1593 to 1665, the Wycliffe of Methodism, a Cambridge scholar, became vicar at St. Stephen's, Coleman Street, London, from which he was ejected in 1645 for refusing to administer baptism and the Lord's Supper promiscuously. He was an eloquent and courageous divine, an independent in church government, and a zealous Arminian in theology. His Redemption Redeemed, 1651, written with great learning and with admirable spirit, caused a flutter among the divines of that time. The press groaned with sermons, pamphlets, and books written against it. Top Lady thought it was fully answered by Kendall. If it was, says Selin, I will eat it, as tough a morsel as it is. Dr. Owen came out against it. Goodwin had also advanced views on the nature of the church and on religious toleration. In this he went further than his great opponent, Owen. The latter accepted Romanists, Socinians, and heretics, while Goodwin pleaded from the first for the fullest liberty of conscience as the inalienable right of human nature. John Howe, 1630 to 1705, one of the greatest of the later Puritan divines, had not the learning of Owen, nor the versatility of Baxter, but he was a broad and cultured divine, the choice flower of Puritanism. In 1662, like many of the best ministers of England, he was driven from his parish at Great Torrington by the Act of Uniformity, and led a wandering life. Eventually, 1676, he settled in London as pastor of a nonconformist congregation, which position he held until 1685, when the growing severity towards dissenters compelled him to leave for the continent. In 1687, when James II published a Declaration of Liberty of Conscience, 
he returned but never after held a charge he was friendly with several men of eminence in the english church and was a man of catholic spirit and large tolerance his greatest work the living temple sixteen seventy six is a monument of splendid thought and diction we should not fail to mention here john bunyan the immortal dreamer of bedford jail he was born in november sixteen twenty eight at elstow near bedford and was brought up to the trade of his father a tinker in his grace abounding to the chief of sinners written with wonderful simplicity and charm he tells the story of his youthful sins of his hard repentance and of his late won peace and joy there is no doubt that southey and macaulay are perfectly correct in laying the severe charges with which he criminates himself to a vivid imagination inflamed by a morbid conscience the four chief sins of which he was guilty says macaulay were dancing ringing the bells of the parish church playing at tipcat and reading the history of sir bevis of southampton a rector of the school of laud would have held such a young man up to the whole parish as a model in sixteen fifty three he was baptized in the aus and soon began to preach as a deacon in mr gifford's baptist church in bedford but the high church party was now in power it revived the intolerant acts of fifteen forty nine and fifteen fifty nine and soon the best ministers in the kingdom and of all denominations churchmen and dissenters were either in prison or in exile from their homes for twelve years sixteen sixty to sixteen seventy two bunyan languished in bedford jail quote, compared with which the worst prison now to be found in the island is a palace end quote. but it was here that he wrote the most of his books and especially one which he considered the least important of all and therefore only worked at it at odd moments snatched from his other labors and writings the pilgrim's progress sixteen seventy eight this allegory of the christian life is written in the purest and most vigorous english with the keenest insight into the human soul and with large sympathy with the frailties and weaknesses of human nature it was a long time before it gained the position of a classic which it now occupies its circulation was confined almost exclusively to the lower classes and it is only within recent times that the educated classes have yielded their homage to the subtle charm and power of bunyan's immortal parable the pilgrim's progress says macaulay quote, is perhaps the only book about which after the lapse of a hundred years the educated minority has come over to the opinion of the common people end quote. besides being a literary masterpiece it contains the essence of the whole evangelical theology and it depicts the experience of the christian with the greatest accuracy and delicacy the second part was published in sixteen eighty four it lacks the power and originality of the first part but is a beautiful work the holy war sixteen eighty two would probably have made bunyan's fame if he had not written the pilgrim's progress the last part of bunyan's life was spent in active labors in preaching at bedford and throughout the country and in looking after the interests of the churches he attained the highest authority among the baptists and was called bishop bunyan he got his death through a heavy cold contracted while riding in a pouring rain to london to reconcile a father and a son he died in london august thirty first sixteen eighty eight of the puritan divines it may be said that they were learned pious and consecrated men who strove for religious freedom in a tyrannical age and who held their conscience and their convictions of truth above all price in a licentious and demoralized age they held up lofty ideals of righteousness and if they reacted to a too great severity and strictness they were sterner in judging themselves than others never can the english nation repay the debt which it owes to the illustrious names mentioned in this chapter and to many others equally worthy of remembrance End of chapter twenty nine